So it's election time, and every year about this same time, we're very, very fortunate to have the wisdom of Jim Vesley, <laughs> a former editorial page editor from the Seattle Times, talking with us about the election tonight, right here on Public Exposure. I am Stan Emmer. It is an honor, Jim, for you to be back on the show. Thank you. It's always great to be here with you. We always have a good time. My predictions are always wrong, <laughs> and as long as you keep that in mind, we'll have a good time tonight. Well, so you are not the editorial page editor anymore. You have moved on to even better things. Well, I retired, and that was a good thing for me to do at age 68, and now I do some work with Seattle Central Community College and help the students. But my life and my work is still very much in the public sector and with trying to figure out public policy, which which I think we're going to talk about tonight. Yeah, and, the, and something we were talking about before the show is just the dirtiness, nastiness, just horrible nature of the campaigns this year. Are they worse than ever? Well, they seem to be. I mean, every election season, you and I go through this uh, kabuki dance where we talk about how bad it is and can it get any worse. And I think there is some kind of a threshold that, re that we've reached this year, and it it's caused by money, it's caused by a, a lack of respect for the election process, it's caused by a variety of things. Um, I know that uh, a local pollster, uh, a well-known guy, Stu Elway, has said that he doesn't quite see the anger in Washington State that he sees in other parts of the country. I think we're just as angry here, we're just more polite about it. <laughs> I think that the, the seething of people who are just tired of a process that seems to take them for granted as voters will come to a head on November 2nd. Yeah, well, let's let's get into some of the races. Let's see how they're doing. Uh, the first one up, the big one here, is the U.S. Senate race, uh, Murray versus Rossi. Uh, something interesting from KXOY over in Spokane. Uh, they talk about 34% of the donations are from out of state for Patty Murray, 16% of the donations out of state for Dino Rossi. Uh, 3.5 million from Seattle, Bellevue, and Everett for Patty Murray, 650,000 from that same area for Dino Rossi. And then for big corporations, uh, Patty Murray, again, has a lot more money from big corporations. You know, typically this would be the thing that you would say, well, it's the Republican who's got the big money. That's not true here. No, because uh, Senator Murray is part of the leadership, and whoever is incumbent, especially in her case for 18 years, is going to attract the uh, the numbers and the the bets that are put down by various groups. They're betting that that she will win or be able to make a, a good race of this and that she will return to office. Whether or not she's in the leadership or not, of course, depends on how the Senate goes. But I don't find it offensive that she's collecting more money. I think I'm more offended by how they spend it. That if there is a way of, of introducing some slime factor into your opponent, both from Rossi's side and especially from Murray's side, I think people are starting to get more than offended by that, and, and we still have a good week and a half to go. Does it, uh, I mean, I, I, I'm surprised by this out of Senator Murray's, uh, out of Senator Murray. I don't know that I should be surprised by it out of a campaign. No, and I, I think it's emblematic of a tight race. Uh, they get desperate. I mean, this is big stakes here, the control of the U.S. Senate or the Congress itself. And sometimes the process of the campaign overtakes the, the good nature and the, and the good sense of the candidate. Um, the Boeing ad that you mentioned before about uh, Rossi is, is a fabrication. Uh, he did not claim that Boeing workers should not have a level playing field with uh, with people at Airbus. At the same time, we see this kind of extension of the grit and grime of politics into people who, like Rossi and Patty, are, are essentially very decent people. Uh, I blame a system that is essentially uh, becoming corrupt at its core instead of at its edges. How can we, how can we stop that, or, or can we? Well, I think it, it stops of its own course, and I don't know how or when. Uh, the, the Tea Party movement has something to say about that, or perhaps the rise of individuals 
uh, bereft of party label may have something to do with it, but that's not going to be fixed in the next couple of years. I think that the sense that that people are yearning for policy debates instead of 30-minute sound bites is going to permeate us and may have an effect on the election of 2012. Well, let's actually get into the substance of this because people watching the show, they may be undecided because of all the nastiness that's going on. Uh, Senator Murray, as you said, she's in leadership. She's been there for 18 years. Uh, she's very, very popular with veterans, which normally is where Republicans are. Right. Um, uh, Dino Rossi is someone with experience in state government, and you know certainly there are things that he can say about Senator Murray. Well, you know, I think uh, Senator Rossi, he, he may be uh, fated to uh, to run against the odds every time. I mean, this is his third attempt at statewide mm -hmm. office. Um, this is probably his best chance because it is the best chance for Republicans. I still think the narrow edge still goes to Senator Murray. Um, it, it's really a narrow edge. Huh? I th yes, it is a narrow edge, and it's probably within the within the score of, of error on any poll, I believe. I think this is his only chance, and the, the problem with the demographics of our state is that something like 70 so or 77 percent of the voters live west of the Cascades. And that means that places such as Pierce County are truly the battlegrounds rather than King County. It's going to be close. Um, the interesting thing is that the national media may not be ready for how slow King County is. <laughs> and, you know, we may have Brian Williams living here until Thanksgiving because if the count is very tight and if it's slow, as it has been in previous years, we may find ourselves hanging in the balance here for weeks after the November 2nd. That may not happen, but that's certainly what happened in previous elections. Hmm. Let's move on to a, something different. One of the uh, strangest campaigns I've ever seen is uh, dueling alcoholic beverages. Uh, initiative 1100 and 1105 about private liquor sales and privatizing uh, the liquor sales. And we've got two graphics. The first one is from, it's a Costco poster, and it's about how less expensive um, alcohol is, you know, Cuervo Gold, uh, <laughs> Smirnoff, and Jack Daniels in this instance in other states. Um, and then the next graphic, I didn't know there was this publication, is from Seattle Beer News and Why You Should Vote No. Uh, I know it well. Right. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I <don't> know. <laughs> um, my assessment of this is that both fail. And I, I, th I, I base that not on any numerical fact, but when voters seek uh, dueling initiatives, as we did a few years ago between the doctors and the lawyers on the state ballot, the tendency, I think, for, for voters is to say, no, I'm not going there. I, I don't know which one is yes, I don't mm -hmm. know which one is no. And so it's easier to say no. I, I would suggest that of, of these five or six ballot initiatives, only a couple of them are going to pass. And I think that's reflective of a general sense that people are tired of the process and they're willing to say no. Well, should either one of them pass? I, personally, I'm not ready to say yes. I know the Seattle Times has endorsed uh, 1100, which uh, makes it easier for places such as Costco and others to to sell hard liquor. Um, I, I've, I've debated this thing and I don't feel that the state needs to be in the retail business, but we have a case here where, where there are so many different backers of these two initiatives that I'm, I'm prepared in my own mind to say, let them go away for a while and come back with a different format so I don't have to make a choice between the brewers and the distillers. <laughs> We're going to take a break. We're very fortunate to be uh, talking with Jim Vesley, who's a, the former editor of the editorial page of the Seattle Times for 18 years. Uh, he helped uh, get the opinions of so many people, not only inside the Seattle Times, but uh, those who are readers of the Seattle Times. Strongly encourage you to go and pick up the Seattle Times uh, as well. Continue to read the, the newspaper. Uh, but also, something else to talk about. Uh, SCAN, the community media where we come to you from, uh, the potential for its equitable share of uh, cable franchise fees looks pretty tough right now. 
if you believe that this is a good venue, uh, this is a good place for, and a, and a good part of community media that comes through your television set, strongly encourage you to just send a little, a short little email to richard.conlon at seattle.gov, richard.conlon at seattle.gov. He's the president of the Seattle City Council, and just say keep scan. Okay, so we've taken care of the Senate. We have taken care of liquor or beer or something like that. Now the U.S. House, there's an interesting race that's just close by. Uh, Dave Reichert and uh, Suzanne uh, Delbinet, I think. Mm -hmm. And uh, the race for the eighth, uh, how, how do they contrast each other? Well, the, the fascinating thing going back to this issue about ads is that um, uh, the Reichert ads, one of them has this really curious line in the end of it. It says, you know, elect Dave Reichert, send Washington a message. <laughs> well, he's in Washington. <laughs> Congressman Reichert is in Washington. The The formula of the advertiser is to, is to try to tell us that the incumbent is not really the incumbent or that he's uh, 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 somehow in the minority, which currently he is. Um, I don't see that Reichert can be beat this time around. This is going to be an R year. Uh, the more interesting fact is that we have nine congressional seats in our state, which I suspect was going to go up to ten because we're going to pick up a, a seat as our population increases over uh, coming from the last census. And uh, the status quo has been uh, three Republicans and six Democrats. I think that might change. I think uh, Mr. Larson might get defeated by Coster and up north of here in the uh, in the second cor congressional, certainly Norm Dix is not going to get defeated. But we might have a, a bit of a change here, where instead of nine three, uh, we might have eight four. We'll see what the tenth congressional, if it comes about, looks like. That uh, Coster Larson ad uh, or uh, campaign is really really dirty. Where does all this money come from? I mean, I mean, where does it come from to run all these ads? Television's not cheap. No, and you know the the sad thing is that you and I don't own a local television station because the money coming into the local TV ads has got to be phenomenal. The money comes from a variety of places, and some of it is above board, much of it is not. And of course, the recent Supreme Court decision calculated some of that or gave us a pre-calculation of what was going to happen. Nevertheless. I still think that people tune out so much of this stuff that eventually they go on instinct and the, that second congressional is both a dirty campaign but a very highly swing district that had Republicans before and this might be it for, for Mr. Larson. Mm -hmm. Let's go uh, back to an initiative, uh, mm -hmm. one that is being talked about across the United States and it's uh, 1098, the state income tax. And, we, and we've got a little asterisk there because this is an income tax based on an income range. Yes. So don't want anyone to think that it's an income tax for everybody unless that's what, what one of the ads are saying is true. Yeah, uh, I, th I think it's going to fail. Um, I think that we've had several enumerations of this. Uh, Dan Evans, certainly the most respected politician of my generation, tried to do this when he was governor. Uh, Ron Sims, the former county executive here, ran a gubernatorial campaign in the primary on a state income tax as one of his formulas, and he, he carried, I think, one county, maybe San Juan County. This is not something that, that people feel comfortable with. And I think in this year, this year of the no year, I would call it, I can't believe this is going to pass. One of my respected colleagues at the Times always would tell me that we're going to get a state income tax as soon as Oregon gets a sales tax. So that we're kind of in this in this situation where neither state wants to move on the pendulum and this is a noble effort with a lot of money involved in it. Um, I Once again I could be very wrong but it doesn't seem to me that in this year in particular that people are interested in investing more tax authority in government. 
Well, and, and just, just shortly before I came for the show, I saw a report out of Texas that the governor of Texas is uh, encouraging Washington state businesses to move to Texas because they don't have it. Well, sure. And the other question to ask is those states that have an income tax, like Michigan and some of the others, how are they doing? And in fact, they're doing about the same as we are. They're all, all the states are cash poor. Yeah. Uh, a very, very interesting uh, campaign, one that I'm not sure that I completely understand or understand the initiative particularly, uh, is 1107, the uh, rolling back of the soda and candy tax. And, and do we have that, that video? This is an ad of, from the, the anti, or the pro-1107. Do we have the video? We do? All right, let's, let's go to that ad right now. The new tax scheme the politicians in Olympia put on grocery items makes no sense. They tax thousands of food and beverage products, not just candy and soda. They put new taxes on bottled water and other common beverages, on foods made with meat, fruits, and vegetables, even on some organic food products. And under the politicians' absurd definition of candy, products like these organic nutrition bars are taxed, but real candy bars like these are exempt. Even worse, they put new taxes on food products made by Washington companies, like locally made chili and pancake mix, but not on similar products made by their competitors in other states or countries. Like I said, it makes no sense. The good news is voters can repeal this unfair tax scheme by voting yes on Initiative 1107. Voting yes on 1107 will end the new taxes on food and beverages and tell the politicians to stop taxing groceries. Okay, now that's the, that's the pro side. The, the no side, let's go to the graphic because it's protect Washington, vote no on 1107, and uh, stop soda lobby lies. Okay, I personally, I drink a lot of soda. I don't care about paying that extra tax. When I see the ad though that says that, you know, you're, you're, there's more taxes on Washington businesses than on out of, out of state businesses, then I get, right. I, I start to question it. Well, yeah, and uh, the two cents per bottle I don't think is going to bother anybody. That's two cents that you find next to the cash register in the little ashtray. Um, but I, nevertheless, I, this is one of the few that I predict is going to pass. I, I think the, the revocation of this tax has been very well handled by uh, the beverage industry, which is pouring a lot of money into this thing. It has this local hometown residence with the the people who are are shown in the ads, especially the the young woman whose whose uh, whose company is is touched by this tax, and once again in this in this kind of spirit of no, I'm not so sure that that people are are ready to give some advantage over to Nestle's Crunch over some other local uh, locally made product. Um, this is one of these. One of these initiatives, you, you don't know what you're buying here. The, if you remember years ago, you'd have to, you could buy Dr. Pepper and you'd pop open the cork and, or the cap and you'd see what you won. But of course, they already sold you the bottle. <laughs> so, that, so that even though if you won something, they knew that you had to buy the bottle to open up the cap. And I, I think this is the case where all the money aside, there is a visceral kind of emotion here that somehow this tax uh, excludes Washington business uh, in a way or uh, that, that should not happen. So we've gone from the U.S. Senate and the uh, U.S. House to uh, dueling alcoholic beverages and candy bars. <laughs> That's what you get right here on Public Exposure with Jim Vesley, the former editor of the editorial page of the Seattle Times. He, he's usually here about once a year shortly before the election, trying to uh, help us make sense out of this, and this is a year where we sure can use the help. Strongly encourage you to go to the Seattle Times, uh, pick one up at your newsstand, and read it cover to cover. Uh, and also, while you're doing that, then go to your email, send a little email to richard.conlon at seattle.gov. He's the president of the Seattle City Council. And uh, just say that you like this medium. Keep scan, keep scan. Okay. Now there's something that, that I'm not sure that I really understand this at all. It's uh, uh, Initiative uh, 1082. It's private workers' comp insurance. And what I've done is this: the first graphic on this is comes from, uh, it's about voting no on this and, and AIG. What does AIG have to do with workers' comp insurance in Washington State? 
Uh, as far as I can tell, uh, virtually nothing. I mean, they are or were or continue to be a large umbrella uh, company that deals in a lot of products dealing with the insurance sector. But clearly in, in, the, in the concoction of the ad, this is seen as the touchstone, as the little bit of, of uh, soda pop that they can put into this ad that will suddenly stir people and no one's going to be a friend of AIG after yeah. the last two years. Um, this, is a, this is one of these complicated things that voters suddenly ask themselves, why am I, asked, why am I being asked to decide this? Uh, it did make an attempt to, someone did make an attempt to get this through the legislature. The legislature wouldn't bite, so now we have it part of the initiative process. I, I don't think voters are in the mood to, to parsec these things and to try to figure out whether Mike Kreidler is right or, or that. You notice in the latest ads, they're not attacking the issue, they're attacking Mike Kreidler. And, you know, that's where we get in the last 12 desperate days. Yeah, 12 desperate days. Do we have that, uh, do we have the ad ready? Uh, yeah, let's go to the, this, this is the, the Pro 1082 ad. Let's go. Welcome to Monopoly Airlines, where every journey is a surprise! surprise! Where will you end up? Surprise! How much will you pay? Surprise! Will I put you two on the same plane? Can this pilot even fly a plane? You won't know until it's too late. Enjoy your surprise! Some surprises aren't so great. Why is L&I hiding their new rates until after the election? Stop the monopoly and save your job. Vote yes on I-1082. Okay, so who's funding this? Is this, is this the big insurance industry? Um, well, this is no on, uh, on the issue, I believe, and so that would be uh, uh, the unions and the other folks who are opposed to opening up this, uh, this competitive market to, to everyone. I mean, I, when you look at that ad, I guess it's charming and fun, but the average voter has to interpret what is L&I, mm -hmm. what does it mean to me, and what's this got to do with the things that are most forcibly on my table? I think it's one of these campaigns that, that appeals to uh, a, a kind of a sliver of voters who follow these things or especially the interest groups such as the unions and on the other side uh, the construction industries who favor this. Well, let's go to an, an initiative that's a little simpler and, okay. and it was written by Tim Iman. Okay. <laughs> and it's... Um, uh, and we actually we have one graphic on it. This is uh, the Seattle Times editorial page uh, said vote yes on Initiative 1053. And basically it's, uh, well, let's go to the quote from, from it. It says, the critics argue that a two-thirds rule is undemocratic. They're wrong. Uh, 1053 is a direct act of the people upon the state. You can't get more democratic than that. Well, I, I didn't write that, nor, <laughs> nor did I edit it. Uh, but uh, I, I agree with it. I, I think that of the raft of initiatives that were kind of floating on down the river, this is one of the two that I suspect will pass. And the, the core of it is that the people voted for this two years ago. And then our constitution in the state allows the legislature then to change or repeal that initiative two years later, which of course the legislature did. And people don't like that. Uh, those people who follow this kind of stuff say, I voted on this once. It's a permanent job fix for Tim Iman, but I think in this case, in this, in this particular era, he's got some momentum on his side because people are going to say, you just asked me this two years ago. I told mm -hmm. you what I wanted. Now you don't want me to do this? So there, there's this kind of uh, backlash to what the legislature has done. And uh, in the booth, I just want to let you know, we, because we're running out of time, I want to skip over to uh, something from the, the Telegraph in London. Mm -hmm. uh, the headline is, Midterm Elections 2010, Tea Party Poised to Storm Washington. And I thought this was interesting because this is what England is looking at our elections and saying. They say the prospect of a Tea Party triumph in the midterm elections when all 435 House seats and 37 Senate seats are going to be contested 
demonstrate one movement's remarkable rise in less than two years from a loose coalition of protesters against government spending to a significant political force that is highly likely, their words, highly likely to stop President Obama and the Democrats in their tracks. Is London right about us? Well, the British know something about us and tea. <laughs> And I, I think they're overstating it. I think that the Tea Party has within it its, its seeds of its own discontent. I think some of the candidates in Kentucky and perhaps Nevada will win. But the general theme of, of American politics is to accept the broad rivers of the Republicans or the Democrats and the, the two fringe groups that hang on either side. For the for some people to say that this is going to be a storm on Washington I think might be correct for the first few months but the legislative process has a corrective ability to tamper people down and to slow the process so that the Tea Party enthusiasts are going to get caught up in the politics of day to day. Are, are Tea Party candidates going to win and are they going to switch the the House and or Senate? Oh, I think the House, uh, no one believes that the House will not go to the Republicans. Whether those Republicans are all Tea Movement uh, candidates or not is depends on the state. Um, the common wisdom is that the Senate will hold for the Democrats but by a smaller margin. And that, even if it's held by the Democrats, for the Obama administration, that doesn't really matter because what happens is that they then get further and deeper into the proposition of of, uh, of complying with what the Senate wants to do. Looks like we're going to have to bring out Congressman Gridlock again. We have 15 seconds. The Seattle Times right here, the newspaper. Do you miss the newspaper business? I do, and I'd like to speak to my friend Mr. Collin and tell him to help support this channel. Very well. Thank you very much, Jim. We strongly encourage you make sure that you vote. We Thanks uh, to Jim Vesley very, very much, former editorial page editor at the Seattle Times. We'll see you right here on Public Exposure next week. Take care. Thank you, Jim, very much. That was good. Yeah. Great.